There are countless planes in Magic the Gathering's multiverse ranging in size and genre to cover just about any sort of fictional setting. Of those planes, Tarkir stands out as one that became a quick fan favorite after its three-set block started in 2014. While Tarkir block would introduce several notable and powerful cards for several formats, many remember it for its more unique dragon-focused setting, the five distinct clans that vie for control of the plane, and its time-bending narrative, which began several sets before the plane even existed and set up future story arcs for many sets to come. While we would not properly visit the plane of Tarkir until its block, development from the East Asian-inspired plane began years prior. The first sense of Tarkir came with the product Plane Chase 2012, a casual magic variant which revolves around plane cards that provide passives to all players and can be left for a new plane via rolling the plan or die. One of the plane cards was Karasha Foothills, a location on the as of then completely unknown plane of Mogseng. While our view of Mogseng was limited to just the battlefield depicted in the art of Karasha Foothills, the armor style and the banners carried by combatants clearly hinted towards a heavy East Asian influence. A few years later, when Tarkir was announced, it was revealed that Mongseng had essentially been reworked into Tarkir and Karasha Foothills, serving as some of the initial inspiration for the plane's design and look. While there are locations on Tarkir that draw back to Mongseng, none of the established names for Mongseng have appeared on Tarkir in any capacity. Much like with Theros and its predecessor plane Arcos, Mongseng is no longer canon since it has been replaced with a very similar plane that draws from very similar inspirations. The exact reasons for the change are unknown, yet regardless, Mongseng was abandoned and Tarkir developed in its stead. Tarkir itself does not draw from any singular real-world culture or region. The actual geography of the plane is diverse, with regions of the plane experiencing year-round harsh snowfalls, while other regions are lush tropical jungles teeming with fruit and wildlife. These varied regions unsurprisingly bred cultures that were vastly different from one another. This manifests in the five clans that make up both Tarkir's primary people groups and also the set's primary draft archetypes. Each different clan drew from different areas of real-world cultures to create the unique melting pot that is the plane of Tarkir. These clans have all existed for generations with long-established traditions and cultures that draw back to the earliest recorded days of the plane's history. The Jeskai found inspiration in the Chinese mysticism culture, their depiction as warrior monks who sought enlightenment in their monasteries. The Mardu are a band of nomadic warriors who draw most heavily from Mongols, including calling their leader a Khan. Their proficiency in horseback also gives them inspirational ties to the Huns of China. The Sultai are an opulent culture with heavy social stratification that lives in the cover of the jungle, most clearly inspired by the Kemper Empire era of Cambodia. The Timur are shamanistic nomads who live a hunter-gatherer lifestyle, most comparable to the Golden Horde of the region that would become Siberia. And the Abzan, with their master of the plains trade routes and various outposts, they most strongly draw from Middle Eastern empires like the Turkish and Persian empires. Our first proper glimpse of the plain was Khans of Tarkir which, as the name implies, focuses most heavily on the various groups that lived in the plane in what was for them modern day. As the introduction of the plane, many cards were dedicated to fleshing out just how life went about the plane. Beyond these glimpses at society, one consistent detail in every region was the vast quantity of dragon bones that littered the landscape. The Tarkir we were first introduced to was a world where dragons had gone extinct centuries ago, with skeletons serving as the only true reminder of their presence. It was the dragon extinction event that would serve as the primary conflict for the storyline of the Tarkir block. While Tarkir had long lived without its dragons, there were some on the plane who resented the state of their world. One such individual was Sarkhan Vol, once a general in one of Mardu's clan's army who eventually tired of the constant war and bloodshed that came with the conflicts between the clans. He eventually found himself on a small sect of dragon worshippers where he found peace, yet chafed at worshipping beings that were long dead. Lacking the means to revive his beloved dragons yet, Sarkhan returned to the Mardu front lines in frustration. It was during an attack on the Sultai where Sarkhan found himself entranced by the spirit of an ancient dragon. Sarkhan sacrificed his warriors to cast a spell so powerful that it ended the battle instantly, and ignited Sarkhan's spark in the process. He was exiled from the Mardu for his actions and left the plane in search of dragons. This all occurred years before we'd be properly introduced to Tarkir, with the character of Sarkhan appearing for years before we learned the full details of his home plane. His search for dragons would eventually bring him to the plane of Alara, and his first proper appearance in the magic story. It was there that he met Nico Bolas, an ancient dragon planeswalker. Sarkhan had encountered other dragons on the plane, yet they all paled in comparison to the power and knowledge of Bolas. He instantly swore his allegiance to Bolas, and the two exchanged blood to seal the deal. This transfusion gave Sarkhan immense power as he became partly draconian himself. From there, Sarkhan served Bolas in his schemes, although his master's abuse eventually caused Sarkhan's mind to unravel into madness. Eventually, Bolas sent Sarkhan on a mission to Zendikir, sending his minion down into the depths of the plane to search for the Eye of Ugin. At the time, Sarkhan was not fully aware of the nature of the Eye of Ugin, or the voice that had been whispering in his mind the more he explored the Eye. 
Sarkon's actions there would have massive ripple effects on the multiverse, but for our purposes, what was far more important than this realizing of the Eldrazi was his discovery of the Hedrons. While in his dragon form, he was able to read the runes, and this ancient mystery filled his addled mind with enough drive that Sarkon the Mad finally listened to the voice in his head and returned to his home plane, although not before taking a chunk of the central Hedron stone with him. This brings us to the date with Khans of Tarkir, with a delirious Sarkon haunted by visions wandering the outskirts of civilization on the plain. At this time, the five clans had been embroiled in conflict vying for control for a thousand years. Each clan came to worship a different aspect of the long extinct dragons that informed their worldview with the Khan as their leader. The absent houses were led by Anafeza the foremost and revered the endurance of dragons and adopted dragon scales as their clan symbol. They placed heavy importance on family, with the firstborn child of each family set to guard their family's kintree for life. The kintree was a fruit-bearing tree that the family would feed its dead in return for the ability to summon and commune with spirits of the dead family members. Further children of the family are free to set out their own paths or even plant their own kin trees and begin a new absent house. They were also renowned for their war strategy and near impregnable fortifications in the ongoing conflicts. The Jeskai Way were led by Narset, enlightened master, valuing the cunning of the dragons to the point they adopted the dragon's eye as their symbol. Their beliefs centered around the idea that the six fires, one for each color of mana and one colorless fire, light the way to enlightenment. Jeskai only use red, white, and blue, but mastery of these three is enough to use ghost fire. Beyond their spiritual pursuits and engagements in the conflicts of the plane, the Jeskai also saw themselves as the historians of the plane. The Sultai brood rallied behind the fangs of the dragon since they valued their ruthlessness, and were led by Sidisi Blood Tyrant. While humans once had more control over the Sultai, over the years the Naga took direct control by claiming ancestry to dragons. The Sultai draw their strength through a centuries-old bargain struck with the feline demons known as the Rakshasa, in an attempt to overtake the other clans through the use of necromancy. Despite this, they are also the ones responsible for keeping many of the more savage beasts that would otherwise threaten the plane from the depths of the jungle. The Mardu Horde were represented by the wings of the dragon due to admiring their speed, and were led by Zergo Helm Smasher. Their lands are not very fertile, so their entire culture is built around conquest and raiding the other clans of their lands. A member of the Mardu does not come of age until they kill an enemy in battle, or another act of honor upon which they are able to choose their war name. And finally, the Timur Frontier were led by Sarak Dragonclaw and valued the savagery of dragons, adopting their claws as the clan symbol. They lived in arctic tundras and learned to wield weapons early in life, with most members of the society serving as capable combatants in their own right. The Timur view their ancestors as frozen in time, and Timur shamans known as the Whispers have a special relation to the flow of time they've passed on for generations. It was the reverence for dragons that was the core to each of Tarkir's societies that finally pulled Sarkon back home. It would be one of the aforementioned Khans that eventually helped Sarkon when Narset found him wandering the outskirts of Jeskai territory. She helped soothe his mind for a time, but not before he raved and rambled about his master Bolas and his machinations against his twin brother, Ujin the Spear Dragon, who he'd slain a thousand years ago. Once Sarkon regained consciousness, Narset confided to him her knowledge of Tarkir's ancient history, and the visions of both other planes in the past that Narset had seen all her life. The two formed a friendship and Sarkon's mind mended further, although the voice he had first heard in the Eye of Ugin persisted. Eventually, Narset and Sarkon resolved to go together to the Tomb of the Spear Dragon, as the Whispers demanded. While they managed to make it to the tomb, Zergo Helmsmasher managed to track them down and sought revenge against Sarkon for his actions years ago. Narset fought against Zergo to allow Sarkon into Ugin's nexus, neither fully aware of what entering it would do. Narset fell to Zergo in the fight right as Sarkon passed into the gateway of the nexus. The Planeswalker vanished in a flash of light, only to crash into the snowy tundra of the Timur region. While at first he was distraught as his apparent failure and the loss of his only true friend, he was soon taken aback by the sight of the storming birthing dragons out of the sky. The shock Sarkon followed the dragon's path until he was assailed by Yasova Dragonclaw, who introduced herself as the leader of the Timur. Sarkon slowly pieced together the Nexus that sent him a thousand years back in the past to the height of the plane before Ugin's death. The plane was quite different back then, with the human factions at odds with one another, but far more focused on their ongoing struggle against the dragons. The dragons might have outright dominated the humans already if not for the intervention from Ugin hiding many humans from dragon perception. Despite Ugin's efforts to protect humans from outright predation, the threat of dragon attacks remained a constant worry for every clan of Tarkir. Sarkon watched as Yasova drew an oddly familiar symbol and asked what it meant. In exchange, Yusova asked about the whispers that the still-afflicted planeswalker had been muttering about. His answers interested Yusova enough that she aided Sarkon in using the teamer's form of temporal meditation, which revealed to her that he was actually from the future. She prodded him for information on the future, specifically on the extinction of the dragons. After his vision, Sarkon now understood the nature of the plane's dragons, 
Ugin had traveled to this plane in his infancy, his very presence forming everlasting storms of mana known as Dragon Tempest. These storms ended with the death of Ugin at the hands of his brother, and ever since then the plane had been thrown out of balance. However, Yasova was well aware of Ugin's connection to the Dragon Tempest, something which confused Sarkon. The two argued further, with Sarkon insisting life without dragons made the clan shadows of their past selves, whereas Yasova was adamant she'd seen visions of the dragonless Takir with her descendants as the high con of the whole plane. When pressed on why her visions conflicted with his, Yasova insisted that the voice in her visions insisted that she needed to travel to the crucible of the spear dragon via tracking the dragons, and once she led to the voice of Ugin, it would kill him. It all clicked for Sarkon, who then realized that the symbol Yasova had carved was the curved hordes of his master, Nico Bolas, whose past self was on his way to Takir to kill his brother Ugin. Sarkon quickly took on his dragon form and flew into the sky to try and save Ugin. By the time he tracked the storms to Ugin's lair, the battle had already begun. Sarkon had managed to help turn the tide of the battle, but upon Yasova's arrival, she used her magic to command Sarkon's draconian mind to kill Ugin. Left with no other choice, Sarkon returned to his human form to escape the command, plummeting to the ground and shattering his body. Yasova began to heal him enough to take him as a prisoner, but the moment he had enough energy, he lashed out with a bane fire and lurched towards Ugin, who had been bested in the fray. While Ugin lay to dying, Sarkon activated the Hedron Fragment that he brought with him, seeing no other options that might preserve the Dragon Spirit's life. It unfolded into a complex device that wrapped around Ugin and preserved him. The moment this happened, Sarkon vanished, only remembered by the teamer who were present as the Dragon Man who appeared to save Ugin before vanishing again into the unwritten now. Sarkon did not vanish from time and space, however. Instead, he found himself back in modern Tarkir, yet not the one he remembered. He himself had changed quite greatly, gaining access to blue mana and having his mind now fully cleared both of Bolas' madness and from the whispers that had been Ugin trying to save himself through time. More surprising were the dragons flying throughout the sky, now the true dominant species of the plane. Sarkon traveled to the canyon where the battle had occurred, only to be assailed by dragon constructs upon his arrival. Sarkon fought them off until Ugin himself finally appeared and unsummoned the overprotective constructs. From there, the two planeswalkers had a discussion, with Ugin having no memories of the original timeline or the echo of himself that had whispered in Sarkon's mind. Ugin was informed of what happened in the original timeline, and he in turn explained his recovery over the last few centuries. He also theorized that Sarkon was now something of a living time paradox, having never been born into the Mardu at all. A thousand years ago, Sarkon Vol appeared from thin air and saved Ugin, only to vanish until the exact moment he was needed to justify his own existence. While far from a perfect answer, it was one Sarkon was able to make peace with, and the two parted ways. From there, Sarkon traveled further until coming across a very familiar face. Narset had survived in this timeline, but was in exile. It was when the two reconnected that Sarkon finally realized the full extent of his changes. For one, Narset had no recollection of Sarkon or their time together. In fact, Sarkon seemed to be the only person with any functional memory of the Takir that existed before his interference. In this new timeline, Narset had grown up not with the Jeskai, but the Ojutai, named for the dragon lord that ruled over them. She excelled in this timeline just like she did in the original, and quickly became one of the masters of the Ojutai. This timeline's Narset hungered for knowledge beyond her bounds as a mere master beneath her dragon lord. She eventually learned of the true history of the plane, that humans once led their own civilizations before the Khanfall that led to the banning of even the word Khan. With Ugin in stasis beneath his own Hedron array, he was no longer able to keep conflicts from fully boiling over, let alone controlling the dragon population. Troubles arose in earnest when the ancient Sultai Khan, Tassigir the Golden Fang, offended the Naga and Rakshasa, and led to their defection from the Sultai. Without access to necromancy, Tassigir was forced to make a deal with a powerful dragon named Slimgur the Drifting Death. This deal would not pay off until a few years later, when the leader of Jeskai, Shun Yun, Silent Tempest, attempted to broker an alliance between the Khans against the dragons. Tassigir had betrayed the Khans, and with the assistance of Silmagar and another powerful dragon, Ojotai, Soul of Winter, subjugated all of the Jeskai clans and killed Shun Yun in the process. This purge also saw the destruction of the vast Jeskai records. The other Khans fled back from their own people, with each clan facing their own hardships before eventual erasure. From there, Ojotai took control of the remnants of the decimated Jeskai clans, fusing their teachings with dragon magic to form the Ojotai clan, with Dragon Lord Ojotai as their leader. The Sultai were dominated by their new leader, Dragon Lord Silimgar, though such as the former Khan Tassigur would be spared for their assistance in the coup. However, dragons supplanted every other species as the dominant one and essentially enslaved the rest. The only left not entirely under draconian control were the Rakshasa, who were tenuous allies and occasional rivals with the Salemgar brood. Tassigur's deal with the dragons gave them a position of high status in the new clan, while the Nagas, no longer able to claim lineage to the dragons, were marginalized and often used for hard labor. 
The original timeline's leader of the Sultai, Sadisis, now existed in this timeline as an undead advisor for the human leaders with no real autonomy for herself. Dragons, of course, were the true masters, with even Tassigur himself being fashioned into a necklace for Salumgar upon his death. The Abzan were attacked viciously by Dromoka the Eternal and her brood to the point of being pushed to the brink. The Dromoka dragons were more aggressive when trying to exterminate their respective clan than any other brood, leading to the Khan Daghader the Adamant to eventually request an audience with Dromoka to learn why she massacred them so viciously. Dromoka viewed the kin tree rites as an affront to the natural order, and while they respected their tenacity and compassion, they simply could not allow such actions to continue. Daghader saw no other choice than to order the end of the kin tree rites entirely. Dragonlord Dromoka became the new leader, and throughout the years, Kintry rites were practiced in secret or not at all. While in the original timeline, Anafenza had been the con of her people, in this timeline she had been martyred for her ancestor worship, and now persisted on as a Kintry spirit herself. Those who still worship are but a small minority on modern Tarkir, with the Dromoka brood and its skill lords providing protection for those of the desert wastes. Yasova survived the confall and was left with no other option than to try to appease the dragons and find some form of peace. She found herself in direct conflict with Artarka, world render, but managed to satisfy her for a while by feeding her the day's hunt. After some time of prolonged feeding to appease her, eventually Artarka purged the teamer of the shamans, fearing both elemental magic and connection to the time stream. Those who remained were recollected beneath their new dragon lord Artarka, with the non-dragon members of the brood simply existing to hunt food to feed their dragon masters. The original timeline's con Surak was now Surak the Hunt Caller whose duty in life was bringing Artaga her lunch and dinner. Some of the shamans had survived the purge, however, and carry on their old practices in secret in the frigid region. Of the clans, it was Mardu, led by Alicia, who smiles at death, who perhaps survived the best. While their region was besieged by Kolagon the Storm's Fury, she had very little interest in dominating the Mardu. As such, Alicia and her people simply threw aside their banners and traveled the plains with the dragons as equals. Over the years, the dragons took more direct control over the former Mardu, before eventually fully wrapping them under the control of Dragonlord Kolagon. While the original timeline Mardu put stock in their honor system, the Kolagon were far more brutal with their dragon leaders. Not only was Zurgo no longer Khan and now simply a low-level bell ringer, but when Sarkon spoke with Kolagon, he learned that he'd apparently never been born into the clan at all. Narset unearthed his history when she discovered a cave full of lost knowledge from ancient Tarkir. This was used against her by her rival, Taigam, Ojutai Master, who had defected a Sultai in the original timeline, yet remained faithful to a Jutai in the new one. While she managed to defeat him and flee, Taigam insisted that all would be known of her crimes, especially the Dragonlord. The weight of the exiling was traumatic enough for Narset's planeswalker spark to ignite, yet she stayed on the plane to further explore the history of the Tarkir she had never got to know. Sarkon was overjoyed to see his friend alive, although the two had to begin their relationship all over again. Despite this, the two hit it off quite well and began to journey through Takir together, uncovering lost histories for Narset and seeing more of the world he had hoped to create for Sarkon. From there, Sarkon and Narset would go on further adventures even on other planes, including both getting involved in the War of the Spark against Nico Bolas. Now known as Sarkon the Masterless, he provided assistance both in the Oerkin scheme to revive niv -Mizet to assist in killing Nico Bolas, but also in the act of fighting against Bolas' forces on the ground. Eventually, both Narset and Sarkon would return to Tarkir to aid in its defense against the Phyrexian invasion two years later. While the invasion of Tarkir was not without its casualties, the plane was able to rebuff the Phyrexians through a loose coalition between the different dragon brutes. In the aftermath of the invasion, both planeswalkers would lose their sparks, leaving them on their home planes of Tarkir for the foreseeable future, and wrapping up the Tarkir storyline for now. Although Tarkir has been confirmed for a return visit in a future storyline. Tarkir is one of the few planes we've seen depicted in very different eras of time and even alternative realities. It is home to Sarkon's Soul of Flame, the living time paradox and former planeswalker who is the only living person who remembers the might of the modern cons. Its five distinct clans have proven some of Magic's most popular factions, with many using the clans and names to denote color identities for three color decks. While not the only plane with dragons, it is certainly one of the most dragon-centric, with its entire timeline having been rewritten to favor them. With the threat of Phyrexia gone, it's uncertain how the alliances made during the invasion will hold, or if Tarkir will return to its endless war it has lived for well over a thousand years. And that's the video. Was there any topic mentioned in this video you'd like to see expanded on in its own video? Or do you have any unrelated idea you feel would be a good fit for the Unknown Side of series? Feel free to comment them down below if so.